Hi, this is Anna, and this is Check It at the Round Table, where we discuss movies, books, music, and stuff. Today we are discussing Modern Love, Season 2, Episode check, 5, peeps. Okay, this one is, am I, maybe, will this quiz, maybe this quiz will tell me. This episode, I really didn't think I was going to like, but it is one of my favorites, especially the final minute and a half of this episode. If you don't watch anything else, but you probably need it in context, so I would recommend watching this whole episode. But the final minute and a half of this episode was poetic genius for the overthinkers in the world. So... This is the story of a young girl who is trying to figure out her relationship self and how she approaches that. So she's in early, I think junior high, I would say. So I'm thinking she's about 12 years old. Her mom is in med school. She has a younger sister. Her parents are divorced. She is busy trying to take care of her younger sister. And her mom really just is not there because she had like an accident a few years ago and had an epiphany that she wanted to go and become a doctor. I'm not saying the mom is wrong to do this, but it's really put a lot of pressure on this very young girl to try to be like a half mom to her little sister, make sure everything works out okay. Her mom comes home late night and is like, I'll get you a glass of water. I'm going, you're getting her a glass of water. That's like your, your thank you for her making sure that they all ate something that night and the house isn't like burned down to the ground. I'm like... This is not the way you treat your kids. But anyway, so that's what she has kind of as the backdrop. In the four drop, she has all her friends who are trying to figure out who they're going to be with, who they're going to date, who they're going to marry in 10 years. I mean, I remember being that age and kind of being a little similar to this girl in the fact that I realized I was very different from other people my age, especially female people my age, because I really could care less about the quote-unquote cute boy down the road or the the dating scheme that people had schematics of, like, I'm going to date this person or this person or this person. I'm going, are they nice? Do they treat you well? Do they have a good personality? Because really that's kind of the thing that will matter in the end, I would think. But anyway, so this girl is trying to deal with all those outside influences. Her inside influences, she really likes this one girl who she sees like on Insta dancing and who she really likes kind of the personality of. So she's a little confused because she took a gay test online. I'm going, you know, I don't mean it weird, but I'm going, I'm not saying the tests are wrong. I'm not saying it's not good to take them. I'm going, you know, on some of those tests, I think it's very helpful, like the Myers-Briggs personality test. Although I will say, when I watched Adam's Ruins Everything about the Myers-Briggs personality test, I was like, why are we taking advice from a person who didn't even study psychology and who she and her mom sat at a kitchen table and instead of writing her next mystery novel, created the Myers-Briggs personality test? I'm going, you know, it's helpful, but it's not definitive. So anyway, if you haven't checked out Adam and everything on the Myers-Briggs, I would definitely go over and check out. If you want a good laugh, go over to Frank James on the Myers-Briggs personality test because he's a great comedian on the subject. But anyway, I will drop links in the description after this podcast is done. So she took a gay test. I'm going, the gay test involved what kind of magazine you wanted to read, what kind of socks you found attractive. I'm like... What the? I'm going, the socks you wear do not tell you if you are gay or not. I'm going, what kind of world do we live in? I'm like, gay people wear all kinds of socks. (laughs) It just depends on the person. And yeah, so honestly, they're going, you know, those tests, they don't really help. But anyway, she takes the gay test and it tells her she's either 20% gay or no percent gay. So she's like, how can I like this girl if the gay test tells me I'm not gay? And my other test tells me I'm asexual. So 
therefore I'm not gay. I'm going, well, asexuals can be gay, but that's beside the point. But in, in the end, she is very confused. And then she has a lockdown at the school. And she ends up on the second floor because she doesn't want to have to go run around trying to catch the flag and the other girl is with her and they're hiding out in the bathroom trying not to get caught because they're on the wrong floor they shouldn't be on that floor and then she just impulsively kissed the girl and then she kind of freaks out they both go back downstairs um the they both get in trouble because they were on the wrong floor and they have to sleep on opposite ends of the school gymnasium away from all the other kids because they were on the wrong floor and the teacher isn't sure what they were doing but knows they weren't doing what they should have been doing i'm going you know maybe if you wouldn't treat them like you're a warden they would be more willing to tell you what they were doing. I'm going you know i'm not sure it would have been better if they would have said well we're in the bathroom stall hiding and kissing impulsively but i'm going well at least you know <laughs> i'm like you know I would be a weird mom, but I'm like, that would not phase me too much. I'd probably be like in Heartstopper season two when they open the door and Charlie and Nick are there kissing and they're like, carry on. <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm a weird person, but I'm like, you know, they're okay. They shouldn't have been on that floor, but we can deal with that fact. But let's just not intimidate people to try to get them to tell us what they want, to, what they were doing, because that's a really bad way to get people to be honest. So anyway, she, um, the main girl character, calls her mom, or texts her mom, asks her to come pick her up because she doesn't want to be at the lockdown. She breaks down in the car on the way home because her mom keeps asking her, what's wrong, what's wrong, what's wrong? And she's like, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. And then she finally just breaks down. And I'm going, the thing is, is her mom says she wants to be there for her. Her mom says she's going to be there for her, that she can tell her anything and it will be okay. And I'm going, you know, I'm really kind of sick of that portrayal in a film. And I'm kind of sick of that portrayal in real life because I'm going, you know, don't tell your kids you're going to be there. Don't tell your kids you're going to be able to have them tell you everything or anything if you really can't take that. I'm like, don't say you're going to be something and then not be that because then your child has no way to trust you. Their trust is broken. It's splayed on the floor. It's like you will never probably get it back. And the reason is, is you need to be terribly honest. I'm going, you know, it might not be the nicest thing to say, but I'm going, if you can't be there for the kid, be honest and say, I can't be there right now. It's not that I don't love you. It's not that I don't care. It's just me, myself, and my development right now is not where it needs to be. But this is not a reflection on you. And I'm trying to get to where I need to be. I'm going, a kid would be so much better off having their parent tell them that than having their parents say, I will be there and do this and whatever for you. I'm like, and then they don't show up. I'm like, you know, that is crushing for some kids. Yeah, they get over it. Yeah, they move on. Yeah, it's okay. But at the end of the day, they're going to know that their parents were lying to them. And I think at the the sad thing in this in the short film or the short episode is the fact that her mom says, you know, you can tell me everything. It you know, you can you can be honest with me. I'm going but she's never there for her to tell her anything. And if she is, she's always asking the wrong questions. I'm like, you know, it's not about sitting there asking your kid what's wrong. It's about sitting there being quiet enough to listen and to be still enough that your kid knows they can tell you what's wrong. So if they do sit there and are crying and say, you know, I kissed a girl impulsively in the bathroom and I'm asexual and I can't be gay, then, you know, you can sit there and go, you know, it's an observation. This happened. Those tests on the internet, they are not conclusive and you're still figuring out your life. And you know what? It's going to be okay. I'm like, that would be so much better than sitting there going, are you okay? Are you okay? Are you okay? I'm like, no, she's not okay. <laughs> but anyway, 
At the end of the night, the girl is home in her own bed. She gets up the next morning and goes to the address of the other girl, who she basically said she wasn't with that night. And she walks in, the other girl's mom and her dad are there, and they're like, you know what, why don't you go away in our daughter's room? She'll be here from the lockdown in a little bit. If you want a smoothie for breakfast or something, just let us know. But go up, make sure your mom knows you're here so she's not worried, and We'll send our daughter up to chat with you when she gets back. So anyway, the girl comes back from the lockdown, goes up to talk with the main character. And the main character's like, this part, I think, is what made this episode. I'm like, this was a great part in this episode. So the the girl comes back from the lockdown. The other girl who impulsively kissed her sitting there going, I am so sorry I did that. I have taken a test that says I am not gay, so I have no idea why I did that. It was an impulse reaction, and you are like a Libra, I'm a Pisces, or maybe it's vice versa, I can't remember which it was. And she's like, so I know this would never work to begin with, and I am actually asexual, so there's no way I could possibly be gay, and I have no idea why I did that, and I'm so, so very, very sorry. And the other girl's sitting there going, so you kissed me on impulse and she said yes because I, I wanted to at that moment and she said okay so let's just calm down for a moment basically she's like so you wanted to kiss me at that moment and she's like yes i did at that moment and she's like okay as long as you wanted to kiss me at that moment we are okay it is all right you were not forced to do this it's not like you were you know had your hands up to a fire rate and somebody was making you kiss me impulsively <laughs> she wasn't that dramatic i'm being dramatic she's like oh and she's and then the other girl sits there who has just had this long literally of apologies and she's like did um did you want to kiss me back and she's like yes i did now why don't we go and have breakfast because my parents make pancakes and it's going to be okay <laughs> and that is how this episode ends now that i thought was absolutely hilarious because it's not really even about like being i think it's really sad in today's modern world in some ways that we love to put people in boxes like this person's asexual this person's not asexual this person's gay this person's bi this person's pansexual i'm not saying that these people are not those things but i am saying i think we love to be able to categorize and put things in certain orders when honestly those orders are not the way it always is it's like I was watching Heartstopper season two, which if you haven't seen it on Netflix is absolutely wonderful. I'm like, I speed watched that yesterday, except for the episode about families, because I was like, that one's going to be a huh, doozy. So anyway, I'm like, but I did speed watch most of that. But the thing that I really liked about Heartstopper is the fact that we have several different sexual orientations in that show, but we also have the fact that no one is really putting people into boxes, except for the people who tend to put people into boxes anyway. Because I'm going, you know, Charlie and Nick, they care about each other. It doesn't matter whether you're gay or bi, they just happen to like one another. And for Tao and Elle, I'm going, you know, it really they are who they are. I love how um, Tao's mom, when she finds out that Tao has gotten Elle to be his girlfriend, she's like, I am calling our family. I am telling the neighbors, we have wanted you to be together for so long. You will make a great couple. I'm like, you know, I wish that people could be more like that about who their children care about or who their children love. It's like, that would make the world so much better. But in the end, I think the thing that I found circling the wagons here so interesting is like I was having some basically inner thought processes earlier this week <laughs> because it's like, you know, I am exactly where I want to be in my life. I'm going, I really am. I have been working toward this goal for like years and years and years. Now, does that mean that everything is perfect? 
goodness, no. Everything is not perfect. I mean, you should see my living room. I have packing boxes everywhere. And my kitchen has black ants, which I'm still trying to figure out how to eradicate. But I'm like, you know, those are minor problems. But in the grand scheme of things, things are perfect. But the one thing I think is interesting is I'm going, you know, I've had a lot of people since I've moved to Asia be like, you're, you're, you're single. You're not with someone. You live by yourself. Like, they can't believe that women in my age group are single. I'm going, yes, I live by myself at this point. It doesn't mean that I'm going to live by myself always because I actually have a couple of people who might come be roommates, but that's a long story. So I'm like, you know, but the thing that it got me to thinking about was I'm like, you know, it's not that I relish being single. I mean, I mean, I like being me. I like my life, but it's not like I'm sitting there going, I'm anti-relationship, <laughs> but I'm sitting there going, I like my life. And I also have realized that sometimes in today's modern dating world, it seems like everyone has these preconceived notions of who they want to be with or what they want that person to be. And I'm not saying that we don't have a type. It's like I have narrowed it down. I'm going, you know, I didn't really think I had a type. But after living in Taiwan for five months, I'm going, if I met a person that was like that country, you know, tall, dark, very friendly, but not in an obtrusive way, I would probably end up with that person. I'm like, yeah, Taiwan is my type. Or something between a cross between Magnus Bane and from Shadowhunters and Pat from Bad Buddy. I'm going, yeah, I would totally go with someone like that. But I'm like, you know, it's not something that really has this. I don't spend endless hours sitting there going, I'm single. What should I do about this? Because honestly, I work like 50 to 60 hours a week and I'm in college at halftime and I run a couple of side businesses. I'm going, I usually have time to work, study and sleep. And I like my life that way because it's just the way that works for me and it brings me great joy. But the thing that I have noticed is I'm going, you know, it was like I was talking with my friend when I was living back in Taiwan, because I did try to date a couple of times when I was in Taiwan, because I met some very nice people, but it just did not work out well. So I was like, you know, I don't think it's a problem about relationships, but I said it is a problem about dating. And my friend's like, yeah, I kind of get you there on it. Because the thing is, is... I like who I am as a person. I have spent years getting to this point of where I am. It's like, I really don't sit there and go, I am X, Y, or Z. I don't sit there and take personality quizzes to figure out like who I am in the grand scheme of things. I'm going, I am who I am. I'm okay with who I am. And at this point in my life, I'm like, if people that I would possibly date liked who I am, I would be okay dating them. But if people who I would date like the idea of who I am and also want to come and flop over like all their preconceived notions of what a modern woman should be, which I find kind of funny, but it's like the few guys I have dated in the last few years, I'm going, they want a modern woman who isn't very modern. Like they want someone who will, you know, bear them children cook and clean. Do this. I'm going, do you not have two hands that you can run your own vacuum and cook your own supper on occasion? I mean, I like cooking as much as anyone, but I'm like, I really don't like telling people I date that I do cook because that could get weird if they tried to like never cook and have me cook all the meals. I'm like, you know, I like cooking. When I have when I have people that I live with as roommates, I'm like, I will often be cooking dinner or breakfast or lunch, and it's just as easy for me to make two plates as it is one. So I'm like, you know, I'll cook them a plate. But, you know, also, if they're free and making lunch, they'll often cook me a plate of food. So I'm like, it's one of those kind of turnabout fair play things. And I think it might be because of the high-functioning autism. I'm really not sure, but I'm like, fairness is really important to me. So I'm going, 
me being in a relationship where the guy expects me to do all the housework, all the cooking, all the cleaning, and to take care of all the kids, I'm like, you know, if I'm going to do that, I'd rather stay single and adopt as I'm planning and not worry one iota about that because I'm like, I'm not getting in a relationship so I have one more person to do things for without any reciprocation on their part because that is exhausting and I don't have time for that with my schedule. <laughs> I'm like, you know, that just doesn't work. But in that vein, when I'm watching this this video of am I maybe this quiz will tell me. The thing that I found interesting is I personally am demisexual. I've always been demisexual. I didn't know there was a name for it until I was 30 and I was kind of searching around on the internet trying to figure out why I thought about relationships so very different from other people. Aside from the fact that I have a very kind of unusual past, which I also think reinforced my demisexuality, which coupled with the autism, there is actually some research out that says that demisexuality and autism may be slightly connected for some people, which I find kind of interesting, but that's a side note. But anyway, it's like I was talking with one of my friends a few years ago when this happened, when I was doing this research and they were like, well, you're demisexual. Are you going to be coming out? Are you going to be telling people you're demisexual? I'm going, you know, I really don't see the need to do that because I'm like, I'm just who I've always been, a person who studies a lot, works, and doesn't date very often. It really hasn't changed anything except I now have a name to kind of explain why I am this way a little better for those who do not know and just think I'm a monk at naturally. <laughs> I'm like, you know, so in some ways I think that it's helpful as individuals to know certain things like whether you're asexual, whether you're demisexual, which is considered a part of asexuality, but does not mean that we don't ever think about passionate things. It just means that we think about them far less than most people do. It's like my friend was asking like, do you ever think about passionate things? I'm going, you know, to be quite honest, it doesn't really cross my mind that often because I'm really busy with work and life and such. But if I did, in theory, have a person, then yes, I would probably think about passionate things more often. But since I don't, I really don't see the need to think about those things, especially with the, you know, doing 16 lessons to 18 lessons a day sometimes that I pull. I'm like, when would I have the time to think about those things? I'm going, you know, maybe people have very different brains than I do. And then I researched that. I'm going, yes, I think the average person probably does have a very different brain than I do when they think about things like that. But anyway, which isn't bad. I'm going, we all need people that think differently. I'm like, you know, I'm glad the world is not full of demisexuals, but I'm also glad that I'm a demisexual. It's like, you know, that's good. It's okay. I'm like, but the thing that I really enjoyed about this video to circle the round rag and again is to say that I love the scene at the end where the one girl is sitting there going, so you wanted to do something. As long as you wanted to do something, as long as it was of your own volition, I'm okay with what you did. So don't worry about those tests. Don't worry about, you know, trying to figure out who you are, or the Pisces or the Libra or whatever. Let's just go have pancakes and breathe a bit. <laughs> and I'm going, you know, that's really what it's about. Because at the end of the day, I'm like, it really isn't about trying to figure out how everything is going to work out. Because I think that's another slightly problematic issue sometimes, at least for some people, because I'm like, some of us, we try to think out everything that could possibly go wrong in a relationship, which we then sit there and at the initial stages of a relationship, will maybe just break things off because we're sitting there going, it's too massive. It's too disastrous. How on earth can we make this all work? And so we don't even try because we fear failure so very much. It reminds me of the scene in 
not to bring it back to shadow hunters but we're going to bring it back to shadow hunters so when i think it's in season two when magnus and alec go out for their first date and alec finds out that magnus has been with 17 something he doesn't know if it's 17,000 1700 17 whatever relationships so he thinks it's 17,000 I think it's very interesting because one woman actually wrote on YouTube in the comments about this because she said you know 17,000 seems like a tremendously high number but she said if we take that and divide it by how many years Magnus was alive it's really not like he was having an affair every night or anything like that and she said besides I really don't think if you watch that clip and really think about it he was thinking 17,000 she said I think what we have here she said especially if you read the books and I don't I have not read all the books about Magnus and shadow hunters but she said if you do read the books she said the thing that you will find is she said I think in that scene when he says 17 she said what he was saying but he didn't want to be caught saying was that he had really cared about 17 people but he doesn't want people to know his number so he tries to make it you know elaborately bigger because then it will carry less meaning and make him less of a softy supposedly <laughs> and I'm going you know that kind of fits Magnus's character but anyway at the end of the day in that episode there is a scene where Magnus and Alec go back to Magnus's apartment Alec's getting ready to leave and go to the academy and whatever and he's like you know maybe we're just too different maybe this isn't going to work which is kind of kind of interesting because Magnus Alec has already come and told his parents in front of God and everybody at his wedding that he kind of just did not have that he liked Magnus and I'm going you know it took tremendous courage for Alec to do that it's like there's a scene where Magnus says you know you will blow up the very ground you stand on to make something right I was at your wedding I saw you do it but he's like you know, Alec has already gone through basically fire and brimstone on this deal, but he's sitting there still doubting the ability to make something work. But at the end of the day, I love that scene because there is a scene where, or there's a moment when Alec is getting ready to leave Magnus's apartment and then he stops himself. And if you think about in the books I think Alec is only like 18 to 20 in the books so he's very young he's constantly doubting himself and his abilities in the books like he has a major inferiority complex but anyway so he stops himself and he turns and goes back to Max he's like you know I don't care how many people have been in your past because you're immortal and Magnus is going well you know I really don't care how many people you haven't had in your past because you're young and you also haven't dated before and so that scene I think is very interesting because it's like you know it's not about what you've been through or what you've seen that's so different but rather it's about how you relate to one another and how you can communicate efficiently because in this episode of this Amazon original series modern of when these two kids who I mean like they're 12 years old who knows how it's going to happen in the next few years but when they sit there and have that moment when the girls when the two girls are sitting there and she's like did you want to do something okay then don't worry about the rest just just go have pancakes and just in, have a nice morning and I'm going you know for the overthinkers in the world people like that are perfect kind of bookends because if you have people that overthink they're constantly second guessing they're constantly worried about how this could go wrong what could happen the domino effect as it were and it's so very daunting and having someone there that's like you know not saying that the dominoes don't exist not saying that this didn't occur just saying that in the grand scheme of things here and now it's okay we don't have to think about everything that could go wrong. We don't have to think about Pisces and Libras and asexual tests or gay tests or whatever tests. We can just go have pancakes and do what we want to do. <laughs> 
And that, I think, is kind of a freeing way to look at life. Now, I'm not saying that it means that we need to be carefree and laissez-faire about life, love, and, you know, liberty. But I am saying that not taking ourselves and not worrying so much, not taking ourselves too seriously, and not worrying so much about everything that could go wrong is probably a much healthier way to look at life than to sit there and try to calculate all that's, you know, possibly wrong with the world. And that is my review of Modern Love Season 2, Episode, I think, 5. Am I? Maybe this quiz will tell me. Check it at the round table. Bye!